ऑप्टिमाइज होगा गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस अगेन इंटरेस्टिंग एस वेबिनार ऑन कार्पोल इंस्टेबिलिटी वी हैव अ ग्रेट टीम हियर हु हैव रियली यू नो एक्सेप्टेड दिस ऑफर एट दिस देयर टाइट स्केड्यूल टू टू हैव अ ग्रेट वर्चुअल एजुकेशन टू आस थैंक यू डॉक्टर माइकल डॉक्टर टोशी नकमरा डॉक्टर पैटेक हुए एंड डॉक्टर रोमनो who have been here with us during this uh, you know great session and uh, dr binay for uh, moderating this session um it was a long due as mentioned with dr michael um and uh, we have the legends uh, of uh, wrist and carpal stability who can uh, you know talk really uh, on those uh, subjects which we had really uh, been thinking of a gray and the dark zones uh, with this uh, brief uh, introduction um i welcome dr michael um who is the associate uh, uh, professor um from the uh, center of orthopedic and trauma research uh, university of adelaide australia um and uh, he has been the uh, past uh, president of australian hand society um he was the past president of uh, the uh, shoulder and elbow society of the australian associate editor of uh, journal of shoulder and elbow surgery uh, dr michael um, we are really happy to have you uh, please go ahead Okay, if you give my screen, I'll um, and you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Good. So, can you turn my screen on? Uh, you can uh, start presenting your screen. You can move the cursors. Uh, I think that it. Here we are. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. I think we're. I think I'm already screen. I'm already sharing though. you can um, press the arrow bar so that you can go ahead with the presentation yeah no it's it's um it's it's live but it's i think can you can you turn on the screen i think you you need to turn it on it is on uh, you, you can see your um, slides you can see your first slide there i can't see it though um no my windows are not um it's not showing Uh, yeah. we can see yeah, I'm, I'm, i'm good now yeah okay okay well uh, good um, good morning or afternoon everybody and uh, it's uh, great to to uh, to join this great group uh, looking at wrist instability and wrist uh, wrist mechanics um i uh, i'm from adelaide australia which you can see the arrow uh, this is my hospital this is in adelaide and the university and that's my office about there So in this presentation I would like to cover um just some work we've been doing over the last few I guess decades or more trying to understand how the wrist works and in particular look at the application of computer based quantitative analysis to explain carpal biomechanics and identify some therapeutic solutions and this has been the subject of my my PhD and and quite a lot of work over the years um I do have a disclosure this is my disclosure I've been um, working on some uh, 3D imaging technology for many years <clears throat> and this has been integral to our to our work trying to un- understand and provide a quantitative analysis of the wrist and in in part these these are some of the images that we've been creating over the uh, over the years from the very basic back in the 90s to uh, more recent ones um and we've extended on from this this um this uh, animation that you can see on the right so i guess rather than simply uh, look at the usual way that wrists have been analyzed in the past where they've been undergone multiple examinations lots of cadaver work uh, our approach was to try and take a step back and and work out what the wrist actually does and and how do we explain the wrist um there have been lots of so called theories out there the column the ring um, sliding and, and flexing and dart throwing and, and many of the the Mayo clinic work and but years ago when we started all this there was a lot of these so called theories there were a number of un, unexplained mechanical challenges um in particular the trapezo scaphoid connection the differential scapholinate rotation and how how the linear was controlled these things are all really not well explained by so called existing theories now i think what's interesting is um the question is what is actually uh, or so why has this been so difficult to sort out i think one of the reasons is that, that all wrists are different you know, all faces are different uh, and and each wrist has its own unique shapes and the bones are different shapes and the ligaments have different connections and this has created a big 
a challenge in terms of finding a some sort of unified pattern. And really, the current theories have generally been based on attempts to reconcile voluminous empirical observations, uh, a lot of cadaver work and other ex, ex vivo and in vitro work. Um, and the aim is really to, uh, to, to, to explain the risk in a sort of a, um, a fairly simple way, but this, is, this has been quite challenging. The other the reality, of course, is that all risks basically perform the same sort of functions and tasks. And uh, I think to start with our work, we need to look at um, what is a theory. Now, I think that uh, what is a theory has been defined as, as something that it must explain a system or process based on limited observations. It must be testable and so-called hypothesis testing. It can never be proven, but can be validated, enriched or rejected. And also it must be predictive. And I think what's happened in, uh, in risk research, this really hasn't been uh, theory based a lot of it. It's been largely empirical observation. It's been quite problematic. Uh, lots of measurements, try and find patterns, crunch the data, try and find a fit and then try again. But really there's been no standard risks. Our approach has been somewhat different to this where we'll be looking at a conceptual or theoretical approach and ask why the risk does what it does and how it could possibly achieve that. And uh, we make some sort of fairly general observations and then try and identify and propose a theory uh, on how this could happen and then propose uh, hypotheses which we then test so rather than measure and try and make a fit we, we make propositions and then try and test if these are validated enriched or, or try something else so we need a new look at the wrist and uh, we need to move away from the endless measuring of how bones move and try and find out consistent patterns among or and this try to find consistent patterns what we what we should be asking is what does the wrist do and how does it do it and conceptually how does it do it so if we look at what the requirements of the wrist are they are basically um to, uh, to position the fingers and palm in space and to create the required functions. And what we've found, what we've proposed is that, is that the main function of the wrist is to provide this sort of second and third metacarpal, this sort of stable central functional axis around which the mobile uh, thena and hypothena axes move, or axes move, or elements move, and must provide rotational and gripping power within a slim wrist. There are a number of uh, degrees of freedom for any joint. There are pitch and yaw, up and down, back and forwards, in and out. But in reality, the wrist actually only has two, that is flexion extension and radial and ulnar deviation. Um, essentially, all other wrists, although there's obviously some, some flexibility, all other, other, all other motions are resistant, such as rotation, um, sagittal translation, coronal translation, distraction and compression. These are all resisted by the, by the various ligaments. So if we have this wrist with a functional requirement, and we, we, can, we can assess there are perhaps seven basic uh, requirements of the wrist. The wrist has to achieve adequate flexion and extension for pushing and holding. It needs to achieve satisfactory side to side motion, adjusting to hold at different angles. It needs to deliver powerful rotational force. So the wrist itself must resist rotation that's delivered by the forearm. It must also, it must also resist translation in uh, coronal, sagittal translation, and also resist distraction and compression. So there's a lot of things the wrist has to actually do to do, it, do its function. And on top of this, it needs to provide this oblique power grip for, which, which really achieves a collinear palmer and forearm for spear holding and throwing. It needs to do this with independent finger and wrist motion. It needs to do this with a very low distal profile. So there's a lot of demands that the wrist must achieve to do its functional requirements. This, this uh, on, on the back of this, of course, is the, uh, the biological constraints where the bones need to be perfused and have limited articulations and there are no axles, only connected by external linkages. So there are, and there are also considerable anatomical variations. And to try and reconcile some of this, we've uh, published our work uh, some years ago on the unified model of couple uh, mechanics based on computational derived isometric constraints. And I'll explain that a little in a minute, but basically it's the isometric constraints. So these, these consistent connections between the, between the bones. And we've also added this, the concept of rules-based motion to reconcile the variation between the wrists. And this, this uh, works to support this so-called standard central column, which we believe is the basis of how the wrist actually works. And so we had this strong connection between the radius, the lunate, the capitate, and the second and third metacarpal, this sort of stable central column. Now, in our work, we found that uh, we had wrists which we, we positioned in radial and on deviation. We then created uh, 3D models and we assessed the which areas remained isometric through range. And we certainly found them there was there were areas on the triquetrum and the lunate, the lunate radius, and the scapha trapezium, as well as the dorsal, and these corresponded to. Uh, the, long, the lunar triquetral, the long radial lunar, and the scapho trapezium ligaments on the volar so, side, and the scapho lunar on the dorsal. And, and these, in fact, are connections that the computer found, not what we actually then assessed. So this was a, 
an extractive or computational analysis, uh, which happened to uh, match exactly the ligaments that were been described. Well, not all of them. In fact, we found the long radial lunate before it had been described. What was also quite fascinating is that um, if we looked at the wrist in radial and ulnar deviation, but also flexion extension, the, the same isometric constraints applied, which, which basically imply, which basically implies that the proximal row, if you look at the, specifically the proximal row, can only move through one arc of motion. So if if these bones have isometric constraints, which are consistent through flexion extension and radial and ulnar deviation, then the proximal row must only move through one arc through those two those two ranges of motion, which is kind of a kind of a challenge. And what's also interesting too is we also found that the distal row moved through a, through a very specific and very constrained arc of the uh, uh, sitting on the distal row. And this ma matches with Moritomo's work where the distal row was actually uh, attached to the scaphoid and basically rotated through a, a single axis. Now, the, the thing we've found as well is that the, this axis actually rotates as the trochretum rotates. So, and I'll show you that in a minute, but the, the distal row rotates on the proximal row, pivoting around the scaphoid. And so we're starting to build up this sort of pattern of, uh, of linkage between the, uh, between the rows. Now, in the mechanical world, we, and this is a, clearly a very, uh, a very schematic uh, representation of how this might actually work, we could, this, we could probably achieve this by having these two cylinders, the distal row and the proximal row. And basically what happens is these, they're, they're attached at one end very rigidly, and uh, they have a variable or a movable uh, sort of rotating, uh, rotating pivot at the other end. So it's fixed at the scaphoid end and rotates on the ulnar side. And so what happens is that when the wrist goes into radial deviation, the, the, pro the proximal row flexes, the distal row extends, that gives us radial devi deviation. And as the, the, the uh, row to, rows offset, this gives us the, uh, the different the differential rotation. And again, similarly, ul ulnar deviation, this extends and this flexes. And, I was, and so what we basically have, have suggested that the, the wrist could be described as two cylinders in sort of schematic form. When the cylinders move in the same direction, you, we, uh, you can, can achieve flexion extension. When it goes in opposite directions, basically what we're achieving is radial and on deviation. Now, this is all very well in this sort of very, schema very schematic, but if we actually look at this wrist here, so these are 3D models which are which will move um, obviously artificially, but what we're basically doing is looking at the proximal row and the distal row as they move through uh, in, in sort, of, sort of sequence, which is clearly artificial. So the proximal row flexes, distal row flexes. So this gives us flexion, as you can see here. And if you look on the side now, so distal row, proximal row flexes, distal row flexes, this gives us flexion. Similarly, extension and extension. And so the two rows moving through a single arc of motion give us flexion extension. Now, how does this work for radial and ulnar deviation? Well, in radial deviation, the proximal row will flex and the distal row will extend. And notice how the triquetum moves to change the offset. So we, we, we can achieve uh, through a single, uh, a single arc of motion at each row, this differential, um, and similarly with ulnar deviation, extension, and flexion. Now clearly there's more there's more given the joints, but this is a way to explain how the the two rows can uh, can move in a single axis, but but achieve the two degrees of freedom. And so what we basically have, have just suggested is that there are these two linked rows, which are which each move through a single arc, arc of motion, but have a variable variable offset pivoting around the scaphoid trapezium joint. They're connected, as I said, on, the, on this radial side. And then under, under the load of the tendons attached to the distal row, um, and particularly to the second and third metacarpal and the adjacent bases of the metacarpals, we get these uh, this arc of motion through the uh, through these two rows. And so it's really the combined binary output of two offset unitary arc joints gives us this two degrees of freedom, flexion extension and, and differential. Now, what is the rules-based motion? And uh, Again, I, this is all this is all in in recent publication in the Journal of, of um, Hand Surgery European, but also I have a monograph out on this as well. But rules-based motion is a way to try and reconcile the great variation between the different wrists. So, what we've described is is four different rules, and these are the bone morphology or the shape, the isometric constraints, so where the where these bones are connected together, the surface interaction, and so the shape and the friction that these bones uh, have. And also the load, and all these, and, and these four, these four variables—the bone shape, the connection, the isometric constraint, and the load—can all change. And if you, for example, the bone shape changes, then the connections are likely to change. If the attachment of the, of the tendons are different, there's likely to be a slightly different shaped bone. And basically, what we have now is a is a product of the shape, leakage, friction, and force, which gives us wrist motion. And so, if you change one, the other one ha ha there's a corresponding change in the other. 
So this reconciles how we have such great vari variation in, um, in, 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 in the wrist motion. For example, if your eyes are further apart, your nose is bigger. You know? So we can, so it, it, it all fits together. And so basically we have this, uh, this, this, this stable central column uh, which, which, is, which is controlled by the two rows, but which is the variation which is described by this, this so-called rules-based motion. And what's happened now? Here we go. So the other thing which is fascinating with, with a, with, as a pattern is emerging is that we have this sort of uh, alternating connection between the rows. So in fact, on the volar side, we have the trapezium to the scaphoid, the dorsal of the scaphoid to the lunate, then volar side on the lunate to the trochoitum. And, and uh, in fact, no bone is directly connected to its either dorsally or, or dorsally and volar to its side, side neighbour. That means we can actually get this rotation of the, of the rows to have a slight, slight variation in shape. Correspondingly, on the other side of the, of the joint, for example, on the dorsal of the scaphoid, it's attached to other bones, either to the other side of the carpus or, and through the DIC, uh, the long radial lunate. The so each of these bones is actually attached to uh, a different row uh, on alter alternating sides. And so this, this complicated pattern, um, which there's great variation. To this, we can also add the, the dorsal carpal um, or the, the dorsal scaphoid lunate uh, sort of connection here, which then provides further st st stabilization. And so what controls uh, lunate extension? Well, we know that the, uh, the, the long radial lunate uh, will pull the lunate forward. And we also know that the, the uh, oops, start again, the long radial lunate will pull the lunate forward and the dorsal um, uh, sort of capsular scapular lunate connection will pull it dorsally. What controls flexion? Well, we know that the lunar trochetral ligament will pull it, pulls the wrist in, the lunate into extension and the connection to the, to the dorsal scapular lunate ligament area will also pull it, um, control flexion. So we have this, this, this front and back control of the lunate uh, in this alternating pattern. Now, I think, I think uh, this is all very, very theoretical, as they say, but um, what we've actually done here is we've then now taken these bones. These, these green ligaments are the ligaments we've extracted from the, with the computer. These are lines we've actually, uh, which, these lines here represent the tendons. And so what we've done is basically got the, the bones which we've 3D printed, applied the ligaments that we think are, are appropriate. And what we can do now, we can actually recreate a stable motion by simply applying the shape bones, as you can see here. Now, the, long, the short lady lunate actually attaches here, which controls, which controls distraction. So we've been, we've, we've been able to reverse engineer the controls and then forward engineer into a, uh, a mechanic. So basically what we have now is a stable central column, which requires a stable proximal row and lunate. And then we can start to look at a very simplified process of uh, DC or VC, and whether it's connected to the lunate, to the scaphoid or not, the sind or sin, and I'm sure this is open for more discussion. So basically, uh, our work on the stable central column, I think, has provided some insights into how the variable function of the wrist can be explained and how we can fix it. And uh, I haven't got time today to, to go over our scaphoid lunate reconstruction, which um, uh, was not, not the topic anyway, but um, basically this has provided some good insights. And um, I would uh, perhaps, perhaps suggest that we publish this, uh, this document online at, through our clinic and also a summary was in the recent uh, European, or the Journal of Hand Surgery European. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Terence, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, perfect, uh, Michael. Uh, it's amazing to see the animation of uh, how the uh, and the distal row, they move, especially in flexion extension and also in uh, radial and uh, deviation. Um, it is a fantastic uh, work. And also the paper, I've read the paper, uh, uh, which is published in the Journal of Hand Surgery, uh, European volume. Thanks once again for this uh, interesting paper. We'll have discussions at the end. Um, I invite um, uh, Dr. T. Nakamura, uh, to uh, present uh, his talk. Uh, briefly, he, he is the, uh, you know, past president of the Asia Pacific Research Association, uh, one of the well-known uh, uh, editor, um, you know, is a great uh, uh, legend and a stalwart in the field of uh, arthroscopy and wrist. Uh, we have uh, many more uh, clots to his uh, name. I was uh, just mentioning that uh, this is the time we had the opportunity to see him. Uh, more or less, we had the opportunity to read all his papers, uh, especially in the and other journals. Uh, thank you, Dr. Toshi, for joining us. It's a great privilege for you, for us to have you. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you.
Yeah, you are very welcome. Thank you, Jerome. <laughs> but, <clears throat> uh, I would like to talk about a uh, more clinical situation. Thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, Dr. Ma uh, Sandu that uh, he actually explains the biomechanics of the wrist very well. Then that uh, uh, that was a, uh, I, I'm very very happy to have a great talk with uh, Michael. So uh, my talk is uh, scaffolding net ligament reconstruction using the capital hamate bone ligament bond. This is uh, my case series uh, of the SL ligament reconstruction. So there is no COI in this presentation. So scaffolding net intercess ligament is a very important uh, structure between the scaffold and the lunate. This is an uh, intercalated ligament. Then uh, the dorsal side of the SL ligament is much stronger than uh, comparing with an uh, approximate side membranous part or a palmar part. Um, in uh, 1972, that Schwindan Dobbins describes that it's, uh, uh, there a great paper about uh, DC and BC and carpal instabilities. Then that he mentioned that the, the lunate is a keystone. So if there is a scaffolded gapping, then that uh, normally that the scaffold flexes, then tracheotome tends to extend. That can show the DC deformities. Uh, after, gradually after the uh, initial injury of the SL ligament. So SL ligament instability is one of the uh, important uh, popular wrist injuries. It can be injured independently, but sometimes associated with the distal radius fracture. Normally, that large extension force applied on the SL ligament may cite SL ligament injuries, uh, especially in a traffic accident, sports, and, and also that out stretched hand in a, a fall. Then that we consider that the treatment of SL ligament uh, is very difficult. Uh, guys, uh, uh, in uh, mentioned his uh, arthroscopic classification in 1996. Three, six. Then he mentioned that grade one to grade four. Then uh, mostly that grade three and grade four injury has uh, uh, severe damage on the SL ligament. Then grade three showing the incongruity and uh, or step of uh, on the radio cap and mid cap joint, and also that probe can be inserted and twisted in the grade three. And then grade four is a 2.7 diameter scope can be drive through, uh, drop through in, in the, into the SL interval. But uh, uh, this classification is a little bit confused me because I normally use the 1.9 scope. 1.9 scope is much easier to pass through in a grade, uh, grade four. Uh, this video shows on the guys who are grade three injuries. Uh, this is the radio carpal site. So you can see uh, a completely aversion of the SL ligament. You can see uh, this is the right wrist, so scaphoid uh, left side and the lunate right side. SL was completely torn. Then uh, in a mid carpal joint arthroscope, you can see a wide gap between the scaphoid and lunate. Then, then that the probe can be in inserted into this gap then that the probe can be rotated in uh, 360 degrees. Uh, Garcia Elias actually uh, mentioned his research question. Uh, first question is, is it partial tear? Then second question is repairable. Then the third question is normal alignment. Then the fourth question, it can be reducible. Then uh, number five question is, uh, uh, his culture is healthy. He actually mentioned that uh, one more question, maybe later, but uh, his stage is uh, uh, normally based on a yes, no question on these five questions. Then uh, normally that the great stage three showing a uh, uh, non-repairable uh, completely tear. Then stage four means that there is a DC or uh, carpal uh, malalignment. Mal on the after SL ligament injury. Then uh, he actually mentioned that stage one is uh, 
uh, normally partial scaffold related ligament injury is stage three is completely disruption with an repairable ligament. Stage three is completely disruption with irreparable ligament but normal alignment. Stage four is completely disruption with irreparable ligament and reducible rototonic flexion of the scaphoid. And uh, stage two to stage four is a very good candidate for uh, scaphoid ligament uh, reconstruction. Then uh, stage six showing the chronic SL disruption with the cartilage loss normally goes to the four corner fusion or proximal local pectomy. Uh, treatment for SL dissociation, uh, the Garcia areas mentioned that the stage one is normally treated with a pinning, stage two is directly repair, stage three is a bone ligament, bone reconstruction, uh, the Q node reports in the second CM bone ligament bone. Then uh, stage C is also uh, treated by a DIC reinforcement, uh, which was described by Vegas. Then uh, stage four is, uh, uh, he mentioned that the three ligament tenodes can work. This is a, uh, an example of the SL ligament pinning. You can see uh, on a wide gapping between the scaffolding in the fresh distal radius fractures. This is a little bit old cases, so I actually pinned with a uh, Kapanji method with an external fixator. Then I pinned the SL for uh, uh, eight weeks. Then four months after pinning, that you can see a gap was reduced. Then directly, if you are showing, you normally using the bone anchors. Then uh, this is a bone ligament bone. Then that uh, uh, Peter Weiss. Uh, actually describes that the bone periosteum bone ligament, but uh, he actually also mentioned that in the complication uh, after uh, after the surgery shows the uh, coalition between the scaphoid ligament or scaphoid and lunate. Then uh, I will talk about the capital hamet ligament reconstruction later. Then this is the DIC reinforcement uh, which was described by uh, uh, Yamaguchi and Vegas. Then uh, blood capsule dasis or brunary capsule dasis, well, that was classical uh, cap uh, capsule dasis, but uh, I don't think that can hold on the scaffold very long. Then uh, Garcia has mentioned that three LT ligament. Then recently that Correra reported, Fernando reported the complete arthroscopy reconstruction uh, of the scaffold nate. Uh, this is a view of the uh, Garcia Arias reconstruction 3LT. So uh, we propose a reconstruction method using a uh, uh, capital hamate bone ligament bone. That was firstly mentioned by a Mayo Clinic and a Mark Rick uh, described uh, in a biomechanical part of the uh, uh, capital hamate bone ligament bone, uh, which showing the normal, almost identical uh, strength of the SL ligament. The indication with surgery was a static SL instability, uh, which showing the more than a uh, four millimeter gap, and also that the dynamic SL ligament instability with a uh, DC deformity or scaphoid malrotation, and also that uh, uh, very important indication is it can be reduced. Uh, skin incision, I normally use an uh, extended burger bishop capsulotomy. Then uh, this is a view of the SL ligament. You can see a, a complete aversion of the SL ligament here. Then the, there's a remnant on the lunate side. Then you can see a wide gap here. Then you can see a capital hamate bone ligament bone here. There is a little bit uh, wider uh, in the width are comparing with the SL ligament. Then uh, I actually take this one, capital hamate bone ligament bone. Then I actually reduce the SL gap. Then I put it into onto the SL ligament. Then uh, uh, those are fixed with 1.2 screws. Then if there is a membranous part, then I actually repair the uh, membranous part of the uh, uh, by uh, two to three switch anchors. Then uh, this is very important because the uh, capital hamate bone ligament bone includes on the cartilage of the capitate and the hamate. Then that can online 
on the scaffold cartridge and lunate cartridge. Then uh, in this situation that there is no uh, bone uh, formation or coalition of the scaffold and lunate. Then at, after the uh, reconstruction of the ligament, then membranous portion was uh, repaired by a suture anchors. This is uh, after surgical, surgical view. Then uh, now that I put in the two pins on the capital, a scaphoid capitate and one pin on the SL. Uh, since 2008 and 18, this underwent an SL reconstruction using the bone uh, capital hamid ligament bone. Then that uh, male it was uh, 15 and two female. Then uh, SL gap uh, more than three millimeters showing the inner 16 list. Then the uh, cause of the uh, trauma was four in 10 cases, sports in six, and the two in the traffic accident. But as uh, reduced uh, preoperative 70 to 14, then uh, this extension the fraction is a little bit reduced by a fraction because of the, this is the dorsal incision on here. So that is why that maybe the dorsal side has a much more scar that can actually loss of fraction. Then modified major risk score showing the uh, nine excellent, eight good and one fair clinical result. And also that the those uh, increase in the more sports activity persons. Then uh, one paralytic peak judo uh, players act after reconstruction of this uh, ligament. Then uh, he got a bronze medal in 2016, the Olympic games. Then, the, then uh, also that uh, uh, two cases were professional boxers, one judo player, one weightlifting play, player. Uh, this is a, a case example that there is a, the professional boxers are uh, reconstructing SL ligament very well. SL gap, uh, SL angle is uh, uh, changed to the 58 degrees and RL angle showing that four degrees, little bit DC deformity. Uh, first case is a 32 years old male with a uh, full shows on the complete aversion of the SL. Then uh, you can see a complete aversion of the SL here. Then I reconstruct the uh, uh, SL ligament by a uh, capital hamid bone ligament bone. Then at that moment that I actually did not trust my operations as I actually checked on the uh, SL. Uh, after uh, eight weeks after the surgery, you can see a complete repair of the SL here. Then that uh, five years later, that he shows an almost normal range of the flexion extension. Then uh, he obtained an excellent clinical result. And also that uh, radial deviation showing the normal uh, alignment of the SL ligament five years after the surgery. Uh, this case is a little bit different that he actually has a professional boxer. Uh, he, he actually abides on the TFCC region and also that SL ligament. Then I actually shortened Jarna with an open repair of the TFCC, but he still, still complain the he still complains the uh, uh, SL gap. So that is why that uh, uh, you can see a wide gap between uh, SL. Then uh, the SL was reconstructed by bone capital hamid bone ligament. But you can see that this screw is a little bit proper. Uh, two, two months after the surgery, that the SL ligament was completely reconstructed. But still he has a pain because of the disc screw. Then I actually looked with an arthroscope six months, after, six months after the surgery, then I removed this screw because an SL ligament was completely reconstructed here. Uh, two years after the reconstruction, that, that, that there is no gap between the scaphalonate, then he returned to the professional boxing. So there are a variety of the SL ligament reconstructions. Then uh, uh, you can see a uh, uh, bone ligament, bone deconstruction. Then that capital hamid bone ligament was uh, almost uh, uh, biomechanically uh, identical mechanical property to the SL, which was published in uh, Litton Burger in Journal Ham Surgery, American Body in 1999. Then uh, we obtained an acceptable clinical result. 
then that that can show them that uh, one uh, of the surgical option uh, for SL ligament uh, reconstruction. So in summary, that reconstruction of the SL ligament using the capital hamlet bone ligament bone substitute was effective to reduce malalignment of the scaphoid and maintain SL gap. And then that we obtained an acceptable clinical short to mid-term clinical results. Then now I actually obtained the 10 years clinical results. Then that, that can actually uh, almost the same as in the ten, five years clinical result. Then uh, this surgery is a very promising. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nakamura. Uh, it was amazing as always uh, your talk. Uh, really, we have enjoyed your talk and learned many things, uh, especially um, uh, as you mentioned about the stage of treatment and your surgical uh, methods of uh, the bone uh, to bone ligament and replacing the scaphoid with uh, the yeah. structure. So, and the results are also thank you, uh, you know, welcoming and pleasing to. Uh, us and uh, in all aspects in terms of functional outcome and also uh, the range of movement. Um, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Dr. Bina, unmute yourself, please. Hello. Welcome, Dr. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, COVID Hello. Uh, am I audible? Hello. Yes. Am, am I audible? Do you have any questions on? I actually no. Uh, no? We will keep the questions for the uh, towards the end of the session. Okay. So uh, uh, let me introduce uh, introduce uh, Dr. Huvit Pat Patrick. Uh, Dr. Huvit Pat Patrick is a senior consultant who is uh, with a vast experience of twenty seven years of hand surgery practice uh, in Paris. Uh, Dr. Huvit works in the Institute. Franck uh, D. Chirge de la Nau in Paris. Uh, Dr. Hovet specializes uh, in the, his main interest are the partial wrist fusions and he has patented several medical devices as well. He's an active member of uh, French and uh, most of the American societies. Uh, uh, Dr. Hovet Patrick, welcome to the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Bina. Thank you, Dr. Terence, to invite me for this uh, webinar. Um, can you see my uh, Can you see my presentation now? Um, not not yet, uh, but, but Okay, not yet. Yeah, we can see that uh, slides. You can see my slides or not? Yeah, we, you can, we can see, but uh, yeah, perfect. Please go ahead. Is it okay? Yeah, great. Is it, is it better like this? Yeah, great. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah. The question is, do we have a safe and effective solution for mid-carpal osteoarthritis? According to um, Dr. Sando, the um, wrist is supposed to orient uh, the hand in space after the elbow and shoulder action. There is an automatic tenodesis motion of uh, flector and extension tendons. And the problem with the total wrist arthrodesis is that it suppresses this function and decreases hand strength around the 50%. So limited fusions are justified because um, Destruction of all the wrist joints is extremely rare. Um, main causes are post-traumatic or after osteonecrosis, and sometimes it's um, chondrocalcinosis, that is um, uh, microcrystalline arthropathy, and Stefan will talk about that. Copal joint reconstruction, depending on localization of intact joints, and the reconstruction is based on uh, limited arthrodesis of the different destroyed joints. But the goal is to preserve some motion around that joints with good cartilage. So the aims 
are to fuse arthritic joints in the goal to stabilize an unstable bone like the scaphoid or an unstable joint like the scaphoid joint. We need to restore the congruency mainly between the first carpal row and the radius to stop the arthrosis progression. But it uh, involved to modify the, tra the transfer of forces between the hand and the forearm. Many variations of intercarpal arthrodesis allow persistence of a certain motion. This motion is only retained for intact joints, but it may result in decreased pressure on a carpal bone or in hyperpressure on another one. The advantage of a partial wrist fusion is to retain some wrist motion, keep the tenodesis effect, eliminate a large part of chronic pain, and supposed to increase the strength. The pitfall are very classic, non-union of uh, partial arthrodesis, residual pain may be present in wrist extension, and the range of motion varies according to the type of limited arthrodesis. So it's very important to pre-op check the cartilage and the uh, different ligaments of all that joints by plain X-rays, by arthroscopy, and we really do prefer arthro-CT scanner. That is our uh, standard exam. We need to uh, check the scaffolding congruency and the uh, proximal pole needs to reintegrate the scaphoid fossa because uh, we need to correct the radio scaphoid angle according to uh, Dr. Nakamura and we need to protect a dorsal conflict risk. Checking the radiolunate congruency, we spoke about uh, DZ and VZ, but the uh, radiolunate joint is very tolerant. The congruency is maintained in all this abnormal position. And finally, lunocapitate congruency, uh, there is a, a very frequent lunate rocking up the capitatum proximal pole, um, evolving the hyperpressure uh, lesions and that kind of picture. The consequences of the carpus trauma are due to two major causes, scaphoidinate instability and scaphoid non-union. First described by uh, Kirk Watson in 1984, we do have the two acronyms, SLAC and SNAC. And Stefan will describe the SCAC that is due to chondrocalcinosis with the same patterns. The SLAC, SNAC, and even SCAC, stage two and three, Treatments use the same partial bone fusion for limited osteoarthritis, preservation of a certain wrist mobility, capus elementarization by suppressing the radiocarpal and the mediacarpal conflict, correcting the disease, restoring the capus 8, and suppressing the carpal collapses, using for us the sole correct space, that is the radiolunate. We know um, the different procedures. First one is the proximal row carpectomy. Uh, it's technically easier than all these different fusion techniques with an higher, with an higher mobility, uh, but it could only be used for snack and slack uh, stage two because we need a cap proximal pole capitatum intact. Possible disadvantages include incongruity of the capitate between and the lunate fossa of the distal radius and weakness because of the slackness of the interesting ta extrinsic tendons. And the risk of subsequent osteoarthritis is significantly higher uh, in proximal row carpectomy versus four corner fusion. The other possibility is capital lunate fusion. Uh, this is the partial fusion that is theoretically best uh, diminishing the radiolunate constraints with a smaller bone grafting with a similar range of motion but with a higher non-risk uh, with a higher non-union risk it's a demanding technique particularly for the dizzy correction the three bone fusion described by my friend Delat combines an intercapital fusion between the short nerd capitate short nerd lunate and amate with a resection of the scaphoid and the trichetron. Um, there is a good mobility 
But the proprioceptive role of the radio trochiotor ligaments is, of course, controlled. It could eliminate the ulnar side width pain that we find very frequently with the four corner fusion. We do prefer the scaphoid excision and the four corner fusion uh, described by Watson. That is the main and classical surgical procedure initially associated with the scaphoid implant. Traditional methods for fixation of the four corner include key wires, screws, or staple and memory staples. But the first circular plate was um, described by um, uh, Arnold Peter Weiss and promoted as a facilitated and more, a more uh, rigid fixation, allowing an early active range of motion exercises. That circular plate fixation for limited wrist arthrosis was found to be a valuable concept. Um, and further biomechanical studies um, were encouraged. In 2003, we create a radio transparent, uh, transparent uh, plating system for that kind of force fusion. We use for that uh, the Peak Optima, that is a plastic with very um, convenient properties because the young modulus and the tensile strength are very close to the cancellous bone. It's a perfect, perfectly biocompatible polymer, which has been used in spine, for example. It's a self-stepping cannulated titanium screw um, that is very important to, cho to choose the, the, the perfect optimal screw angulation. It's a locking screw that will lock in the plastic, resulting in a rigid monoblock internal fixation. That is very convenient too, is that the plastic is radiolucent, so we can see exactly where the screws are and we can check for the healing. I will describe um, our uh, series. We uh, reviewed uh, our 10 years um, patients with 71 patients available for follow up. That means 22 females and 44 manual, uh, 40, and 49 males uh, with a mean follow up of 63 months. The operative technique is very standard. Uh, we perform a longitudinal skin incision along the line of the third compartment, and then the third compartment is opened and the extensor policies is uh, retracted. The fourth compartment is picked up right and the extension tendons are retracted with the posterior anterior neurectomy. We still do this neurectomy. A ligament sparing capsulotomy is performed um, according to Berger description and the radial based capsule flap is elevated to expose both radial carpal and mid carpal joints. First, we examine the radio lunate and if both radial side and lunate are without degenerative changes, one can perform a scaphoid excision. Using, using uh, sharp elevators, soft tissue attachments are elevated from the scaphoid until it is removed, totally removed. Fusion sites are carefully prepared, and this is probably the most important part of the procedure. We need to do a meticulous decortication of the remaining cartilage using scalpel, curette, ranger, or osteotum that is really better than burying. Excision of the osteophytes at the dorsal distal part is another key point. Correction of the disease deformity is mandatory to prevent the, radio, the dorsal radiocarpal impeachment. We need for that X-ray uh, with a fluo scan pair of control we use, of course, the joystick lunatum described by, by Lingshine to correct the disease uh, deformity. So we use a temporarily distal uh, key warrior through the distal part of the radius, fixing the lunate as palma as possible to avoid the contact with the burr. Finally, bone graft coming from um, the Lister tubercle is packed in between the joint surfaces. Another key warriors, uh, other key warriors are placed from the capitate to the trichetrum and from the MA to the lunate to maintain the perfect alignment. If we are in a Viegas type 2, uh, the natural position should be maintained without hyperreduction. 
The depth of the rimming should be such that the top of the plate flush the edge of the cortical cortex. If not, there is a risk of a dorsal radius impingement. And be careful to not too much complete the bone graft stock at the back of the plate because it could be another cause of dorsal radial impingement. We need to rotate the plate to maximize the number of screws in each bone. And if it's possible, it's better to put two screws in each bone. We need to make sure that the plate is still stung just after, uh, just below the dorsal cortex. And then we um, screw uh, the plate. We need to uh, progressively uh, and alternatively tighten the screws um, to avoid the tilting of the cup. And finally, screws heads are just flushing with the cup at the end of the screwing. The trochaetron screw should be quite short to avoid a piezo joint conflict that could be painful. Finally, we correct uh, uh, any screw and we, we close the, caps the capsule and we check the passive range motion to ascertain the mounted stability and looking for dorsal radiocarpal impingement, we put a short arm plastic splint for four to six weeks. This is an example <clears throat> of a 42 years female uh, operate for, for a snack three with a very good fusion and a very good clinical result. What about uh, our result? The mean extension was up to 20 degrees with a good uh, quick dash core with a good union rate and no case of dorsal radiocarpal impeachment. Pain reduction is a constant in the literature and we were happy with 87% of uh, good and excellent results. Uh, the range of mobility uh, value are varying uh, in the literature, but uh, our range of mobility was around 66 degrees with 70% uh, of the opposite uh, strength. Wrist extension, as I told you, was up to 20 degrees and zero cases of dorsal radiocarpal conflict. Nonunion is a classic uh, complication and our rate was four cases, that means 5%, that is globally less than uh, other uh, series. Um, we do um, revision surgery for four patients, that is 5%, uh, with a very good consolation, uh, cons uh, healing finally, and none necessitated a radiocarpal or total risk arthrodesis. We can find a lot of uh, series from these two decades. Um, and we published two different series with these results. Uh, we can find a lot of, re um, we can find five um, bad series with a higher number of non-union, with bad strengths and with bad implant failure. But as we can see in this kind of series, the complications are not only due to uh, the material. Careful evaluation of these reports uh, needs to be very well uh, documented because implicate, implicating the implant as the major cause of the complication uh, is not the um, good solution. There is a lot of traps in this technique. First of all, of course, the best device should not and could not replace the best, the best bone fusion. And, for, and to get a good bone fusion, we need a good, bone, a good burring, a good grafting, and a very good contact between uh, the different bone faces. Centering uh, could be a problem, and the center of the plate uh, is not always at the center of the four bones. Same for rimming. If you rim too much, it will be difficult to center the cup. If you rim not enough, you will have a dorsal radiocarpal impingement. Same for peripheral and progressive screwing to avoid the tilting. And as I said, it's better to use two screws per bone instead of one to get a, a very good primary solidity. That is a gauge for an early reeducation. Bone graft harvest 
must come from a good bone that is uh, better. That means that it's better to use the, the distal part of the radius using cancellous bone than the debris coming from the scaphoid. The bone healing can be uh, analyzed and checked by a CT imaging that is better than the standard X-rays. And we are very happy with the radiolution plate because it's much better, uh, easier to uh, check the healing that with a metal plate. So for us, in slack three, probably, it's better to use uh, this kind of four fusion with a legitimate place in all the, these different available techniques. It's a reliable and reproductive technique. It needs a learning curve, of course. We are happy with the resolution pla plate because of the design of the plate. There is more holes available, uh, and it's a locked uh, plate that allow um, primary stability, allowing um, very uh, early reeducation. But we need for that to check before the indication, the ulnar shifting, the dizzy deformation, and the other carpal uh, deformities. So thank you for being, and thank you, Dr. Terence, for inviting me to your webinar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Howard. It was uh, such an informative talk with a lot of tips like uh, what to do and uh, how to avoid the complications. Very tempting, like for all who has been doing proximal row carpectomy to try the uh, partial fusions. Excellent talk, Dr. Howard. Thank you. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, may I uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stefan uh, Romano, our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Stefano is a founding member of French uh, Institute of uh, Hand Surgery and uh, is a member of uh, uh, French Hand Society and Orthopedic Surgery. And he, uh, and he heads the Orthopedic and Plastic Surgery Department at the American Hospital of Paris, and he's also the Vice President of the Medical Board of American Hospital of Paris. Ve uh, welcome, Dr. Amano. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, not yet, not yet. Okay. Do you Même see them? Faut que tu cliques sur partager. C'est c'est fait. Et après? Et après, tu vas voir les différents trucs. Euh... Il, y a un, un, il faut que tu cliques sur PowerPoint. Non, c'est la diffusion. Ça y est. Ouais. C'est bon. Yeah, ouais, on voit ton fond d'écran. Ouais, c'est bon. Yeah, perfect. Great. OK, it's OK. Yeah, great. Yes. OK, so thank you for inviting us for this nice meeting. I have to start knowing the difficult situation of India to send all my thoughts to the Indian population, knowing the but I know that some in some part of the country, it's quite difficult to get access to the treatment and to the vaccination. So all my thoughts to, to the Indian population. I've been to India many times, and I have to say it's one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, Non-traumatic osteoarthritis of the wrist is mostly known by the rheumatologist and not very often by the surgeon. It was rarely described. It started in the 90s because most most frequently, post-traumatic is, uh, is treated uh, into articular malignant, slack and snack that uh, Patrick Ouvet just described, and also the consequences of Kimbok disease. It was first uh, described in a surgery uh, journal in 1984 by Resnick, who is in fact a rheumatologist, uh, by a letter to the editor um, answering, uh, about, uh, answering a, a paper from uh, Kirk Watson uh, in 1984, where a few slacks were in fact uh, not due to a trauma. And the rheumatologist, Dr. Resnick, uh, um, told that there was, in all those cases, it was uh, old patients, there was no trauma in the past, it was bilateral injuries, and there was calcium deposit in the in plain x rays. So in this letter, he says, be careful in those cases some patients are not slack injury but probably there's something else which which is chondrocalcinosis there were in the past there was also some other papers but mostly in rheumatologist uh, journal like 1963 1974 resnick again 
And this, this disease was called at that time by the, by the rheumatologist pseudoguteus disease because of the similarity of the symptoms of the, cri of those, of the crisis of, of chondrocalcinosis with inflammation and pain and redness of the skin, uh, similar to, to, to gut and to hyperuric acid uh, disease. Another French study in 1975, also in uh, by rheumatologists, but in a radiological journal. Another one, but this paper is interesting because in this paper they first started to to describe the specific aspect of the of the X-ray in chondrocalcinosis, the so-called embedding of the scaphoid bone inside the radius, which is very different to the slack injury, where the scaphoid is lying horizontally. In this chondrocalcinosis, and we will see it later, the scaphoid is at the opposite vertical and embedding inside the radius. There is also a mid-carpal dislocation, like in the snack and the slack at the late disease, but there are more loose bodies than the disease I was talking about. And of course, those specific calcium deposits that we can find in all the risk, but specifically in the ATFCC. Clinical findings. Usually it's a very old patient and the disease has started many decades ago. The one of the bigger difference, clinically speaking, of those of those of this uh, this pathology is that when you have a slack or a snack wrist in the beginning of the generative change of the wrist on the X-ray, the patient is painful, which is not the case in chondrocalcinosis. You can find patients that are starting to be painful many decades after the beginning of the changes on the X-ray. It's so I was saying it's an old patient. The disease started decades ago. No difference between male and female compared to slack and snack injuries which because of the trauma are more frequent on male. There is usually a wrist um, um, disease before the knee disease on chondrocalcinosis. The STT is damaged and it's often a bilateral injury. Clinical findings, it can be in the beginning a carpal syndrome and on 40% of the cases, this is the first symptoms. And if you see an old patient with carpal syndrome with a big painful wrist, should do an X-ray, and very often you can find this chondrocalcinosis, which can be symptomatic only on the carpal syndrome. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean you have to operate the, the wrist, but you can find it and you can tell the patient and you can explain the patient that he also has a disease on his bones. So why is there a carpal syndrome? Probably because of the synovitis of the flexor tendon, which make no more room for the nerve in the carpal, in the carpal tunnel, but also because of loose bodies and osteophytes that you find in chondrocalcinosis. I told you there's a long medical history, very in the beginning of the disease, the X-ray looks normal. There is some acute crisis followed by calm periods and those acute crises, they can resemble an arthritic, uh, an aseptic arthritis. And uh, it's quite common in my, activi in my act activity to be called in the emergency room for a so-called septic arthritis of the wrist. And I find an old patient with a big red wrist with a lot of pain and inflammation. And in fact, there is of course no infection but there, it's, it's a chondrocalcinosis. You can find this typical swelling of the dorsal radial aspect of the wrist, which is due to the localized synovitis, to the osteophytes, and to the loose bodies, which are very numerous in this disease. There is often a lo lower mobility and of course a decreased strength, but it is difficult to measure this on elderly patients. Radiology, I start by the less common pattern, which is the mid-carpal, the mid-carpal uh, injury that someone after me called the stage four. It is quite rare, but you have to know that if you find an isolated mid-carpal damage of the cartilage, cartilage where on the mid-carpal joint and only on the cartilage on the, on the mid-carpal joint without any injury, without any other etiology, it could be, and usually it is a chondrocalcinosis of the wrist. Although it is, it is uncommon, I, will, I wanted to show you this, this picture. The most common pattern is this one. The scaffold, it's, it's associated with a scaffoldinate dissociation resembling on some points to the slack wrist. As you can see on the right side that the scaphoid on the opposite of the slack wrist is completely vertical. It's embedding inside the radius and you can see, you can see the small cave, the small embedding of the radius which, has, which, which, which shape has changed because of the embedding of the scaphoid bone. The evolution goes to a big radio scaphoid wear, just like in the slack and the snack, but also and always with this typical vertical 
scaphoid embedding in the radius. And at the end, there is also a capitolinate dislocation, which can resemble in some cases uh, to uh, all the um, uh, lunate dis dislocations. Because of the similarity to slack and snack, we introduced in 2003 the notion, the concept of SCAC, scaphoid conducalcinosis advanced collapse, which, uh, and there is an evolution in four stages similar to the slack and snack. <coughs> the SCAC one, usually the X ray is almost normal, but if you can look carefully, you can see there's some. Um, the, 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 the bone is very dense next to the proximal pole of the scaphoid. And if you look more carefully, you can even see a small, there is a bone problem on the, on the, on the, on the proximal pole. On the SCAC1, you can look carefully and you have to find those, those uh, calcium deposits, especially on the TFCC, like on the X-ray, but it can be in other places. It can be minimal, but it's very typical when you find this. On SCAC2, the radio scaphoid injury is more, more, more important. There is a verticalization of the scaphoid, as I said, slowly embedding inside the radius. And the lunocapitate joint is starting to be damaged also, which makes it similar to the snack, because as you know, in the slack too, there is no uh, damage of the, uh, the lunocapitate joint. In the snack, there can be a small injury on this, on this, on this joint. In the SCAC2, there is already a damage on the, on the capitolinate joint um, cartilage. The carpal height and the global architecture of the, of, the, of the wrist is preserved due to the verticalization of the scaphoid on opposite of the, of the slack when the, the horizontalization of the scaphoid made the, made the wrist shorter. The SCAC2 looks like a slack, but the vertical scaphoid is embedded. There is no gap, which is quite typical because when you see, when you do, I talk about it later, when you do an arthroscopy on a CT scan, you see, of course, that the ligament is damaged, but there is no gap, which is very typical. And there is also those calcium deposit and loose bodies inside the joint. SCAC3, there is a huge mid couple dislocation. The scaphoid is totally embedded in the radius with an important destruction of the subchondral bone that you don't see in slack and snack. You can see a cartilage damage in slack and snack. You can see a small, a small wear on the, on the bone, but not as much as you can see on those, on those SCAC3. You can see an image here. There is also, of course, a disease, but the scaphoid dissociation is longitudinal. It's not like in the slack, and it resembles a late periodontal dislocation. Although the context is different because, as I told you earlier, it's usually an elderly patient with the injury on both sides. SCAG4 is rare and it's uh, due to the very, to the very long uh, life of the radiolunate joint. As you know, in all diseases, it's the last joint to be damaged. In my first classification, that's what I call the SCAG4. Another author uh, a few years ago called the, the SCAG for the mid uh, injury that I showed you earlier. Usually the patients doesn't go to the surgeon. They're followed by their medical, their general practitioner, their rheumatologist, because the evolution is very slow. And the, the only time they're painful is in those very typical crises, pseudoguteous crises. You can see this example of a patient I treated in the 2000, but in 82, he was already having some crises. The, the X-ray was called normal. In 1989, it was not called normal, but it was this typical embedding of the scaphoid that you can see. You can see it here, the typical embedding. But as you can see, 1998, it's the same patient, although 10 years after, and you can see the embedding is much more important now. And there's also this dislocation of the mid joint that you can see here. As Patrick Uwe told you, we favor the R2 CT scan, although the, the arthroscopy of the wrist is a very good um, way of evaluating the, the damage of the cartilage and the damage of the ligament. In France, surgeons are quite reluctant to do a surgery to have an information. We like to do surgery when we need to treat some patients, but there is a little, um, let's say, low problem if you do surgery on the patient just to have information about his wrist. So it's not very common in France to do an arthroscopy just for a diagnosis. That's why we, one of our 
one of our good radiologists, Dr. Pijo, invented the R2 CT scan uh, more than 20 years ago. It is a tri-compartmental arthrography, followed less than 20 minutes later by a CT scan. It, the 20 minutes time is very important because if you wait too much, the, the, the product will go inside the ligaments, inside the soft tissue, and the contrast will be less, less nice between the black ligament and the white joint. You can assess the cartilage, you can assess the ligaments, and you can choose, as Patrick Uwe said earlier, the exact type of surgery and the exact type of fusion that you can do following the information you have about the cartilage wear. That's an example of, a, of an R2CT for a SCAC3. You can see here the nice cartilage with the black line. You can see the black line here, and you can see here there's no more cartilage on the scaphoid and no more cartilage on the radius where the scaphoid is embedded. That's another image, very interesting image. You see the dislocation of the, of the lunocapital joint is so important that there is almost no contact between the distal surf articular surface of the lunate and the head of the capitate. That's another image. You can see the, 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 you can see the, the, the injury on the ligament, but you can see also this mid-carpal joint injury here. That's on this, on, this, on this slide, you can see the X-ray with the embedding of the scaphoid. You can see the r city and you can see how much bone is damaged here, which is never seen in slack or snack. There's a big piece of bone that went with the years and is damaged by the vertic verticalization of the scaphoid. And you can see here on the operative view, you can see the proximal pole of the scaphoid with no more cartilage. You can see the, the, cut, the, the bone uh, damage here on the radius. And you can see here some calcium deposit. The medical treatment is the golden standard for those diseases. That's why we don't see them so often. Except carpal syndrome treatment, which we can have from time to time. The treatment is usually steroid uh, by mouth, non-steroid anti-inflammatory by mouth, colchicine also, which is a treatment for, for good for gutus disease, for hyperhoric acid problem is very effective on, on those crises. And if you see a patient with those pseudogutus disease on the wrist, you put him on a splint, you give him some colchicine, and usually, usually he's okay after two weeks. You can also, if the crisis is very important, do a cortisone shot. Surgical treatment is done after medical treatment when there is an important dysfunction of the wrist, when pain is not treated by the anti-inflammatory and the cortisone. Quite often it is after a trauma that the patient become very symptomatic and you find in his past history, in his past x-ray, that he, he suffered from chondrocalcinosis a long time ago. The aim of the surgical treatment is very similar to the treatment of slack and snack, as Patrick told us earlier. Partial fusion, carpal bone resection, and also always save the radiolinate joint. Like he said also, Total fusion is very uncommon and very rare because when you do the fusion, you lose a lot of, of function of the wrist. And there's a lot of other options if there is a single joint which is intact. The aim of the CT scan or the arthroscopy, if you do it in your country, is to see which joint is intact, which joint is damaged. And if there is a joint damage, you remove a bone or you fuse a joint and you keep the, the intact joint, of course, who will be the only joint of the wrist. Indication, like all other indica uh, like other disease, is usually step two and three, and most frequently three, because as I said, the symptoms are, are not as early as slack and snack injuries. It is a mid-carpal fusion with removal of a bone, and it can be a four or a three bones fusion. Our friend Delatre from the French West Indies described in 1997 the so-called three bone fusion, which allow, which has a resection of the scaphoid and in this in the surgery the triquetrum which is quite interesting because on those patients with a lot usually of loose bodies and calcium deposit on the other side of the wrist and also knowing the usual early complication of four bone fusion which is pain on the other side of the wrist it treats also the other symptoms a few images about the surgical treatment. We use also, of course, local regional anesthesia, a longitudinal dorsal approach. There's a lot of controversy now about the resection of, or section of the posterior interosseous nerve. We do it now, as Patrick said. Also, some say that it is not good for the proprioception of the wrist, the opening of the fourth compartment, of course. 
longitudinal capsotomy, like, like Patrick said, you can, see, you can see the calcium deposit here and here, and you can see the bold aspect of the scaphoid proximal pole without no, cart with no cartilage at all. We usually do perform also an osteotomy of the dorsal margin of the radius, which Philippe Safa told us a long time ago. Let him rest in peace. Uh, because there, is, there can be some conflicts, even if you embed the, the plate inside the bone, you can, place, you can have some conflicts between the dorsal aspect of the radius and the plate. Removal, resection of the scaphoid, resection of the tarquitum. You can see here the pisiform here after the resection of the, of the, of the retroacuitum. The scaphoid has been resected here. You can see the lunar bone here. Then, as Patrick said, a very, very meticulous and very nice removal of the cartilage and the subcontrol bone. It is very important. It's not the fixation, which is the most important part of the surgery. It is the removal of the cartilage and the subcontrol bone. Then we take some graft from this Lister tubercle and I use it to keep the carpal height and I use a, a temporary pinning to reduce the, the DZ. You don't have to force this reduction and usually it's not necessary to reduce it completely. Otherwise, there would be too much solicitation of the, of the fusion and there could be some non-union because of this. We used to use staples, as you see on the left side, and also those small plates, titanium plates, on the on the right side you can see here the the list of tubercle harvesting here and the plate here we can have different shapes but now you can see another one you can see the post-operative x-ray of the three bone fusion you can see removal of the scaphoid you can see the embedding of the scaphoid here removal of the taquitum staples plates but now as you know uh, patrick uh, designed this very nice uh, export plate that we use uh, every day, very easy to use, very nice because you can see the bone, you can see the healing. It's a very low profile plate. plate. You can see here that the plate is about there. So even in dorsal extension, there will be no conflict between the dorsal aspect of the wrist and the, and the plate. A small series that we did recently, 10 patients, six male, four females, mean age was 70. You see quite old compared to the slack and snack, which usually are treated between 40 and 50. It's a bilateral pathology on all patients. Two patients had previous operation. You can see on the right side the slide of this patient that had, that had a titanium implant replacement with failure and pain. And one patient has a, had a styloidectomy. Three had previous carpal syndrome release. Results, mean follow-up was 53 months. Seven patients had no pain. Two patients had pain in maximum motion. One patient was still painful when lifting heavy objects. But when he had the same problem on the other side, he asked for the same surgery. The strength was good and similar to other publications. The range of motion was similar to this type of, public, of, 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 of surgery on elderly patients. And on, after a late follow-up, there was no degenerative change on the X-ray. On summary, although it is a common pathology which is not always painful, when it's symptomatic, it's often mistaken as a post-traumatic slack or snack wrist. Surgery is rare and at the late state, at the late state, but it can decrease pain. Three bone fusion seems to be the right choice because of the removal of the tarquitum. And you can use those new fixation device, but you don't have them available. You can use pins, you can use small plates. But I have to say that since we have those, it's much easier and we have a much lower rate of non-union. Of course, further story is mandatory because the number of cases is not so important. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Uh, wonderful slides, beautiful presentation, and very informative talk also. Like, uh, this is one condition each uh, wrist surgeon has to keep in mind, uh, who routinely see a lot of uh, wrist patients in his clinic. Uh, I have one question, uh, Dr. Romano. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Romano, how, how, like, uh, do you find it uh, easy to uh, uh, Remove the scaphoid from the radius, or it is a bit difficult and as it takes time. Yeah. Well, the, 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 removal, the removal of the scaphoid is always a difficult time. When you do a four corner fusion, a three corner fusion, it's always a difficult time. The embedding of the scaphoid doesn't make it doesn't make it more difficult. Doesn't make okay. it more difficult. What make it what make it difficult is the the the, the itself, which damage all the ligament of the of the joint. So 
it is very rigid. For example, the STT joint is very rigid, so it's very difficult to move the scaffold. What I do usually is I, I first cut it in two parts. I remove okay. the proximal part, which is easy, and then I okay. go slowly to the distal part and remove it piece of bone by piece of bone. Okay. So how, how often the patients will have it on the bilateral? Like, uh, is it very common to have it on both sides? It's, it's almost always on both sides. Always the surgery both is not sides. always done on both sides because they are not okay. usually at the same stage. Okay. Okay. So most of the patients end up doing it uh, both sides. Procedure. Well, not all of them, because as I told you, the surgery is not mandatory. Very often, patients are okay with some anti-inflammatory from time to time. We use surgery only when there's no other treatment that, that works. So very often patients have it on two sides, but not so often have surgery on two sides. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Man. Thank you, Dr. Amno. Uh, we have a lot of questions today, and we will really take a couple of questions uh, considering the time. Uh, questions to um, Dr. Toshi and uh, Dr. Michael Sando. Um, since this uh, audience are also from uh, people who are watching YouTube and Facebook, uh, those comments which are answered here uh, will also be uh, useful to them also. I'm going to repeat the question again to both uh, Dr. Toshi Nakamura and Michael Sando. Uh, what is your view about uh, 360 degree repair, uh, uh, which has been uh, uh, in the recent publication? And uh, how often uh, uh, do you use uh, dorsal capsulitis in all your procedure? Uh, Dr. Toshi has answered it, but probably to the uh, wider uh, audience, uh, could you comment on that, uh, Dr. Toshi, and then Dr. Michael Sen? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, the 360 degrees reconstruction means that uh, uh, Fernand Correra's arthroscopic completely reconstruction of the SL using the half sleep tendon of the FCR, and also that the PC who also describes that his free tendon graft, the PL tendon wrapping around the dorsal and the palmar scapulonate ligament. Uh, I, I think that there's the two publications. Then that the Fernand Correa's reconstruction is superb because uh, he actually reconstructs an uh, uh, anatomically with an uh, uh, half sleep tendon of the uh, FCR that can stay alive after uh, reconstruction. Also, he uses a uh, 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 interference screw to fix to the scaphoid and cap uh, lunate. Um, and I think that my opinion that uh, it works very well, but uh, it is quite difficult to to my understanding. So that is why that uh, I I will try to do this one, but uh, I'm not convinced with that I can successfully uh, do this kind of surgery in arthroscopically. Um, so that uh, yeah, that still I need some time to see his uh, reconstruction in a cadaver workshop. Then at the PC holds uh, reconstruction, the, he actually tied down the PL tendon on the scaphoid and lunate. Then that uh, the free graft bone tendon uh, that can, to my understanding, that cannot last longer uh, because you know, it's a dead uh, tissue. Um, but my capital ligament bone is also that the, the tissue, so that there is a little bit contradiction. But uh, uh, PC Holtz mentioned that the, uh, his midterm clinical results were excellent, and also that he's showing that uh, during surgery that the reduction of the SL is completely with the tie down on the PL tendon, so that we need uh, more time to uh, gratify that those clinical results. And the second question is the capsule dasis. Uh, I actually mentioned that the blood capsule dasis and Brunel capsule dasis, uh, but to my understanding, it is not an anatomical uh, reconstruction. And also that uh, I actually have an, uh, many cases of the failure of the blood capsule dasis and also Brunel capsule dasis. So that is why that I actually pinned on the scaphocapitate and scaphorinate for eight weeks. Then after removal of the paint, then that uh, SL gap, SL gap is still holding. Then that uh, DC has also reduced. Then, uh, so I don't need any uh, those are capsule DCs in my surgery. Thank you, Doctor Nakamura. Doctor Michael Sandler. Yeah, um, I guess our approach has been somewhat different to um, what Toshi is talking about. Um, 
I, I think uh, the the stability of this central column, I think, can be uh, lost with uh, a number of, uh, of, of structures. The scaphoid trapezium ligament, the long radial lunate ligament, the dorsal scaphoid lunate, and I think there are other structures as well, the scaphoid capitate ligament. There's a whole combination of SIND and SID, which can, uh, and I think the key is to try and identify which which is damaged and try and restore the anatomy, let's say. Now, I think that uh, in my in my images, I I showed that the, tri the triquetrum is actually moving quite a lot, which allows the distal rows to rotate. And I think for that reason, the, the, the 360 repair, which goes around and tethers the, the triquetrum is a concern because I think it actually creates a non-physiological tether to the triquetrum. So I think as a principle, it's probably not that sound. So I'm, I'm not so happy okay. with them. And I'm sure Sanj would not like me hearing say that, but I, I think it doesn't make sense to me. Secondly, if we look at the motion of the scaphoid and the lunate, um, uh, as they move through radio and oral deviation in particular, there's a differential rotation. And so I think the, um, the, the idea to actually tether the, the volar and the dorsal aspects of the lunate, I think is wrong because I think you, that, 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 that alternating sort of snaking connection between volar, dorsal, volar of the proximal row, which allows the proximal row to rotate and change its shape very slightly, particularly to accommodate the distal row, I think is critically important as well. So again, the idea of actually tethering the volar and the dorsal scapula in it, I think is wrong. And I think a lot of the work that was done, which identified um, connections on the volar side, basically were uh, maybe incorrectly looking at the long radial lunate ligament contribution to stabilizing the volus lunate. And so I think that the an understanding of the long radial lunate is really that important volar structure, not the, not the volus scapula lunate ligament so much. So uh, I think that, um, and I, I'm actually not even sure what a capsule of thesis actually is. I, I think it's a, it's a sort of a, a general term, which just means, I guess, applying some sort of tether to the to the joint, um, which for me is is uh, maybe non-anatomical. The other concern is, that, and I know Scott Wolf and I have done a lot of work looking at some cadaver work, and I think th th this this all sort of uh, I guess adds to the hypothesis-based approach to this whole process is that um, if we say that this particular structure should be important and then we go and test this structure on the cadaver, you're more testing a specific in, in, and you're specifically looking for a uh, the contribution rather than simply measuring and then trying to reconcile what, what you find. So, yeah, when, so, so when, when, we, when we talk to Scott about these things, you know, the, the long radial lunate seems to be a much more important ligament than maybe we had thought previously. And so, and the final thing is that we've done, um, and I, we published the ANAFAB procedure, which is a, a dorsal and volar reconstruction that's been uh, both in the in European Journal, it's been uh, presented at the American Hand meeting a number of times. Uh, and I think this is a way of trying to identify the various um, sort of combination of, of injuries that, that, that contribute to creating the unstable central column and specifically looking at each of those. Now, as part of our initial work, we have been looking at um, trying to reproduce, let's say, components of repairs that are existing. For example, the, the parts of the Brunelli and parts of the um, uh, uh, Ackerson's repairs and, and certainly some of, um, say, PC Ho's type reconstructions as well. And so in the evolution of our, of our approach, we were using a synthetic tape plus tendon. Now, both Scott and I have had a number of failures as we maybe we do, we're not, it's unfortunate. And, and what's been quite concerning for me is that when I've gone back and explored these few failures that I've had, and Scott has found the same thing, that the tendon is actually mush. And so I think, uh, again, I, I can't, I just can't reconcile that tendon does anything that, 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 that just create mush. You know, tendon is not ligament, it's dead structure. And, and, and in six out of six, six cases that we've actually explored at about the two or three month mark, there is no tendon left. It's, it has no structural integrity at all. And so uh, in terms of the questions here, I think volar and dorsal scaphalina is probably wrong. I think the the Lunate 360 doesn't make um, doesn't make sense to me, and I think using tendon is uh, is is problematic. And so we're now evolving to looking at our our quantitative analysis to try and diagnose the structures which are damaged, and we're now moving to using only synthetic tapes 
um, which are secured through drill holes. And we've now done that for the last maybe almost a year, now, year or so now and have actually been quite pleased because I've had a couple of patients who have a very large um, bone tunnel enlargement, which is bothering me. And I think what's fascinating is that the bone tunnel enlargement, if it was purely a mechanical abrading process, you would expect that to um, sort of soar through the bones in a very, you know, in, in one direction uh, or the force. But in fact, this is actually whole holistic enlargement. And I just wonder whether it's the dead tendon that's causing the enlargement in some of these patients. And um, so uh, our, on the basis of our work, I've sort of gone right away from a lot of these whole concepts. I, I'm just not happy with using tendon. I'm not happy with the, the, the circumferential. I'm not that happy doing front and back of the of the of the scapulonate joint. So, and I think consequently, um, by by identifying which particular structures have gone, we've now managed to restore the uh, function in the wrist and our wrist patients to really um, really very satisfactory, almost normal. Some of them, they're not all, of course, but um, and this has been Scott's experience as well. So, I think a more anatomical approach, really based on a um, on a specific sort of diagnostic uh, extraction, should we say, I think it's important in, if to try to address what's, what's a fairly variable set of, uh, of injuries. And I guess one further thing is having uh, proper 3D images of, the, of the, the wrist injury to assess exactly what's going on, I think is very important. And one thing I didn't mention here before is that I think it's very interesting that the scaphal limit gap is not just this, it's actually a three-dimensional shift. shift. And I think the scaphoid can go dorsally quite a long way. Um, and so the gap itself is actually not um, uh, the whole answer. It's a, it's a three-dimensional uh, separation. So that's a, that was a whole other paper. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Dr. Michael. Enjoyed your explanation because you know, I have read this uh, article from Dr. Scott about the role of a ligament stabilizer, um, especially in the cadaveric study. And obviously, they have found that uh, to have a DC deformity, at least uh, you should have one of the ligament associated with the scaffold unit uh, uh, to be injured to cause the deformity. In fact, that was wonderful. I mean, we had also tried in our cadaver and also found that uh, the scaffold unit injury, ligament injury alone does not produce uh, the DC deformity. In addition, you need to have, as you mentioned, the long radial ligament or uh, either a complex DIC uh, should also be injured to cause this. Uh, having said that, uh, the, the questions to the all the panelists, um, is this, uh, you know, treating the scaphalonate um, uh, injuries uh, based on, uh, you know, from Michael Sando, the, uh, the three-dimensional view, uh, his computer analysis, or uh, do you really, uh, you know, find the role of arthroscopy and, uh, and the use of questionnaire wires alone for scaphalonate or three-corner fusion uh, or four-corner fusion? Are we overdoing it or what is the current rationale right now? Uh, so each uh, speaker can uh, uh, unmute themselves uh, and then uh, they can talk uh, for a few seconds. Okay, Toshi, you... Yes. Uh, I'm sorry that... Uh, could you have an uh, Could you have questions? Uh, Toshi, uh, Toshi, the question is, are we uh, overdoing in sca regarding scaffold net injuries or uh -huh. is this the way we have to proceed? Uh, uh -huh. All those surgeries and all those modalities, are we overdoing it? Uh, is the right way to do it? I see. I see. In my understanding, that uh, uh, still that in my understanding, that this is cell is much important than other structures. So, uh, so that is why that I reconstruct the dosa SL. And then that also that uh, uh, tendon is not a good substitute to uh, reconstruct the ligament. So if we reconstruct the ligament, we need longer uh, tendons to tighten up. Then also that we need a uh, large uh, incision on the dosa on the borer side of the SL. Uh, so that is why that uh, I actually foc focus much more, more on the dosa as a ligament. Then uh, but also that I, as I uh, show you that it worked very well. Then uh, I think that uh, uh, by actually reconstruction, a cell ligament, dosa as a ligament, uh, a little bit 
Proxima, comparing with the normal side, and also that the capital Hamid bone ligament that match with. So that is why that uh, uh, this kind of three-dimensional uh, material reconstructs in the three-dimensional ligament. So in this manner that uh, uh, only that the dorsal series works very well. And also I didn't touch any uh, soft tissue when I reconstruct on the SL ligament. That, that is also that useful for the patient. Thank you. Very well. <laughs> Dr. Sandu, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think as I was saying before, I think there's a whole range of injuries that um, we need to try and diagnose very carefully. And I think the ones that I'm we're looking at, which the the, the anafab, the front and back reconstruction, is dealing with is that sort of um, non-arthritic but but fixed deformity group that uh, Garcia Elias talks about, where th there's a lot of deformity there. And I think if you look at um, Christoph Moulin's work, um, they're looking at almost undisplaced uh, sort of pre-dynamic instabilities, which which do well with some of those other reconstructions. And so we're talking about much bigger, much more fixed deformities, and and they're the ones that I'm sort of seeing, I guess and which are more challenging than uh, some of the other uh, Corella and uh, Moulin, these techniques are actually um, uh, are addressing. Um, I think that arthroscopy is very important to diagnose exactly what's going on, um, but I, I would say that our, th our 3D imaging has been really quite helpful to understand and measure the distance between the, the bones and actually really understand where they're, where, where they're displaced and, and, and what the sort of deformity has occurred in fact which ligaments are likely to have been damaged and try and address the exact uh, injury itself so i think it's very much a work in progress and certainly our, our, I, I don't think we can be so confident just yet to go fully to tape but i think the wrist is different from the knee i mean the knee does not do well with just just synthetic but i think the wrist is different there's a lot of capsule there's a lot of soft tissues that are in the area there's a lot of um partially torn ligaments and i think if you can hold it together long enough with some sort of tape, the local tissues will actually respond. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patrick? Yeah, I, I, I'm personally, I use the, the, um, the Garcia Elias um, <laughs> algorithm. So it depends from, uh, for me, it depends essentially from, 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 from the delay of the injury, you know. If um, I can use, arthroscopy and debridement and binding if the, the, the injury is very uh, close, very recent. And uh, after two or three months, uh, if uh, we can find uh, two, two stumps, uh, two correct stumps on both uh, scaphoid and uh, lunate, I will go for direct repair using uh, anchors and uh, pining too. And if um, there is no stumps or if uh, the, the stumps are bad and the cartilage is always intact, uh, I will go for, for uh, triple tenodesis uh, using the Garcia Elias technique. And uh, when the, the, the osteoarthritis is present, um, I think it's, we are uh, in the, the beginning of the, the, the slack lesion, and uh, we can use all the different process uh, possible of the different possible process. That means uh, styloidectomy and uh, only on a capsulodesis or a proximal rocarpectomy and finally on stage two and three and probably three uh, partial fusion. Uh, it's really depending on uh, the, 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 the delay from the, 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 the injury. And I don't know for you, but for us, um, people are consulting quite later after the injury you know uh, it's uh, very rare that the patient uh, come uh, just uh, one week after the, the injury uh, due to uh, the first treatment with the splint with uh, just uh, peels and so on so the the the, the good exam mri or upper ct scanner is done uh, only at three or six months later and that that is the problem thanks dr patrick uh, dr stefan romano Uh, Dr. Roman, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, I have a similar uh, philosophy of the one of Patrick, but although we work together, we don't do exactly the same. We use we use the same algorithm that we that the author showed earlier, the the Garcia alias 
algorithm. But then the surgery you do depends also of the type of, of patient you have. And um, I, in my practice, uh, the American hospital, we have uh, um, mostly non-manual uh, workers. I don't have a lot of manual workers in my activity. So, uh, uh, and manual workers usually go to the consultation quite late. <laughs> And then my activity, they go quite early. So finally, at the end, um, in emergency, I do pinning. Then I do a lot of direct repair of the ligament when it's a quite recent injury. And I do, which Patrick doesn't do, for the next, when there is, when it's reducible, I use a bone ligament bone uh, treatment. Where the one I use is vice. I'm very interested by the one, by the one uh, described by, by Toshi earlier, because it looks very interesting. And this ligament looks really like the real native a scapulonate ligament, but I've been using for many years the, the vice technique, which I like very much, although it is a very demanding technique. It's a technique technically very difficult because you can break the thing in two pieces. Uh, I liked in the drawing by Yoshi the, 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 uh, the direction of the screws, which must be divergent. And what I do usually is I do the distance between the two screws on the, on the, the, the graft is smaller than the, than the distance in the bones. So it it it, it tends it make a tension on the ligament, but I use I use this and f finally not so often I would use the the, uh, the Garcia Elias technique. But in my in my in my activity, those fixed uh, dislocated uh, scaphoid injury are not so common. So finally, what I do most uh, frequently is direct repair and bone to and bone ligament bone uh, um, treatments. Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Romano. This is wonderful. Uh, if uh, Bina, if you don't have any questions, probably we can wind up the session uh, with the uh, with the four speakers. Uh, they can quickly share their final comments. Quick, thirty seconds, uh, final remarks, closing remarks from all the panelists. Uh, I, I have just one question for Dr. Toshi. Like, uh, uh, have you like uh, the pieces which we take the capitohemic ligament which we harvest? <laughs> That yeah. bone piece uh, is quite like a flimsy. So, have you found that you know when you put the screw, it has shattered? And uh, if if it happens, it may not have happened. But if it happens, do we have a plan B? You mean at capital hamid? Yeah. Yes. Because the capital hamid ligament is much wider. Okay. And normally, I take a half, proximal half of the capital hamid ligament. Then okay. The, the okay. patient has a dosa half. Okay. Okay. So it is quite thick enough. It won't uh, shatter when you put the screw. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oshi. Uh, a quick uh, 30 seconds uh, closing remarks about this webinar and the future of uh, scaffold node injuries to all the delegates. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Michael. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very, very interesting session. Um, and I guess my, my feeling is that the understanding that has been, uh, we, I guess we've, um, uh, extracted so far with some of the past wrist injuries have, have not been able to explain a lot of things that are happening. I think with the work we've been doing recently, it seems to give me a much better appreciation of the variation in the wrists and be much more driven by the theory, then diagnosis and then treatment rather than seeing a gap and trying to prevent it and, and be very, very reactive to, to things that we're seeing. I think this is becoming much more sensible in terms of uh, long term. And, and also, if we understand the theory, we can actually say, well, you know, if we find these things we haven't seen before, we can actually apply the concepts to explain what we see rather than necessarily um, guess at what's happening. So I think it's, it's a very exciting time. Thank you. Dr. Toshi? Yeah, I agree with the Michael that uh, he, he and also that uh, uh, Scott actually describes that the many mechanical uh, papers recently, then I, I actually have a great interest with those. Then uh, still, uh, the, I think that still we have uh, many questions about the SL. Uh, even they say also that we also had an uh, LT ligament uh, problems as well. DC deformity, DC deformities, seed and sin, uh, also that uh, perinate injury and then uh, and perinate uh, non dissociative injuries. We have we have more, but still that we need to clarify those issues step by step. Then that uh, those are those are very important for us to uh, conquer this uh, very very difficult question. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good, Patrick. Please unmute yourself. Yes. yes, I think that we have good we have um, good treatment, good possibilities. But before to treat, it's necessary to uh, understand the lesion. And um, uh, the, the the lecture of uh, Michael was very interesting. And probably um, today we do have the 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 uh, the, the algorithm coming from uh, uh, Garcia Elias. But uh, tomorrow. Probably uh, that kind of uh, examination, that, that kind of numerization of the wrist uh, associated with um, IA probably will help us to predict uh, and to uh, decide what will be the, the best treatment according to the lesion or according to the mechanism of the, 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 the pathologic wrist. Thank you. Dr. Romano. I have to say that I started my residency in 1986. At that time, the most important part of hand surgery was microsurgery, and that's why I entered this, this specialty. Uh, but at that time, exactly, started the surgery of the wrist because all the pioneers of the wrist started to, to make papers at that time. Kirk Douglas, Talisnik, uh, Safar, and, and we started to, they started to think about the scaffolding ligament in the late 80s. And now we are almost 40 years after this, and still we don't have the solution. So yes. there is a lot of work to do. That's what I have to say. There's a lot of work to do. It's a work in progress. Can I, one final, one final comment? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's true, but I think, it, I think one of the most important, um, I think, stages that we got, we, we have arrived at, if, if I look at that, that model I showed, which, which, is, which has the, our, our whole aim for these last 20 years or so has been to identify um, which ligaments are intact, which ones are missing, and then in a virtual environment, create a, a model of the wrist, reapply the ligaments that are present, and then look at the ligaments that are missing, and then make the wrist move under its own pathological sort of mathematical model. And then we can then apply certain operations, certain repairs, certain ligaments, and then see how it actually changes. And then using things like uh, foreign element analysis and, and loading patterns work out whether we can actually reproduce what we what we we find in terms of motion. So oh, I think pre-trialing operations based on the patient's own pathology, I think, is the key to the future. We need there. Thanks, Dr. Benay. Benay, unmute yourself, please. Uh, yes, it was uh, such a wonderful session with a uh, lot of uh, information from all of you and your viewpoints on the, especially the scaphalonet injuries was very interesting. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, so uh, I mean, we had a great uh, good number of participants as well. We had almost uh, 27 participants. So uh, I hope uh, it, yeah, they all uh, it benefited them also, their talks. So thank you all for uh, being there for the uh, webinar. And uh, thank you. Thank you, each one of you. Thanks, Vinoy. Thank uh, 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 quickly, uh, we'll wind up the session. Thanks once again. Uh, we had a different uh, panelists from different parts of the continent, uh, from Australia, Japan, and uh, uh, to France and India. So it's a really fantastic uh, day today. We have learned a lot of things, right, from 3D animation from Michael Sando, and we hope we have a paradigm shift from uh, his uh, 3D to virtual and then to patient. And Toshi almost uh, exactly, you know, uh, uh, mentioned that like, like reconstruction. Uh, mm -hmm. Tendons are not like, uh, you know, they behave, don't like, uh, behave like the ligaments. So it's, it's a carry home message from Toshi. Uh, ligament has to be like ligament. And then Dr. Patrick, of course, three uh, partial fusion does have a role. and. Uh, yeah, but Stefano and Romano both uh, equally they contributed uh, well about the aspect of 3D uh, CT scan, use of CT orthogram, and the, the role of uh, the partial fusion and uh, uh, the fusion plates they have introduced. Of course, we have, laid, we have learned many things. We all know that wrist is evolving. Uh, we need to change or we need to keep ourselves updated in all those things. A day will come where we will feel that wrist, of course, in our hands. Uh, rather, till then, uh, we'll keep updating ourselves. Thank you all for this uh, wonderful day joining with us. And thank you once again. Wishing you all safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Romano. Dr. Romano. Dr. Romano. Here we go. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Michael. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, we enjoyed it. <laughs> you you made it a day. I mean, it, yours was excellent. I mean, uh, the change in uh, complete understanding is from your talk. So amazing. Please keep doing your good, great work. And the best thing is, if someone can prove I'm, prove I'm wrong, then we can do <laughs> better. <laughs> I don't. I don't think anyone can prove it better because. Uh, well, it's it, interesting that the best thing the best thing can ever happen to a theory is it's disproven because that means a better theory turns up. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I think it's amazing, like uh, the, the difference in the proximal row and the distal row movement, and of course the, the rotations and the oblique uh, uh, views, the oblique uh, obliquity of the ligaments. They, they won't allow the you know the, they allow the row rotations completely different. I mean, I think mechanism is really tough yeah. to understand, and definitely right. talk was amazing. Thanks. Good night. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Right. Bye. Leave that.